All right, so I am Aaron Madsen. As I uh, mentioned before, I work here at OC Tanner. My presentation is probably not going to be as high level um, as, uh, as the subject of event sourcing. We're just talking about building a simple, a simple Node.js command line. And in the moment here, I'll be logged in and able to set this up. The downside to having a new password for every device that you have, while it's secure, you have to remember which password you're logging in with. work. There we go. That looks about like my presentation. Set this aside. I may or be, may not be using that. All right. Building a command line or building a Node.js command line. Um, there's some pretty simple, um, pretty simple things we're going to go through to, to, to actually do this. How many of you have worked in Bash, Perl, um, at various forms of shell scripting, other scripting languages to build a uh, to build a command line tool. Okay, um, you can do it in you can do it in PHP. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of different ways to to, to build a, uh, a command line interface. Node.js has a pretty simple way to do that that actually learns from those. So here are the basic points that you'll need to build a command line application in Node.js. You'll need a, a command line interface entry point. Which, uh, which is a JavaScript file. You'll need a, a bin reference in your package JSON. You'll need the main mod, mod, module you're going to work with. And you'll need to publish this module. There's ways to get around that, but basically you, you need to publish the module. So package JSON looks something like this. You can see we've got a main key here that references index.js. Pretty, this is pretty standard for a node module. What's that? I don't know where to post them, but I'd be happy to. <laughs> um, it, I'm, I don't think I've uh, put this up on GitHub yet, but I'll do that and I'll make them available that way. This uh, presentation is actually written with Reveal MD, which is a node module that does slides that are compatible with slides.com. Um, so you can take a look at that and you can rewrite it if you want. Um, it's a pretty convenient, pretty convenient tool. But you can see also I have this, this bin key here within package.json. That lets me set, assume that I want to create a, a command line called thingifier, which was a name that was not taken and didn't have any particular meaning um, that would work well for an example application here. So thingifier, and it refers to bin thingifier.js in my project. Well. I could, but then I'd actually have to come up with application logic. So as we'll see, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really thinking hard about, uh, about Thingifier here. <laughs> bin, bin Thingifier here, um, this, is, this is the file that will be referred to by, uh, by that. And it's just going to require my main module, and it's going to call it. Well, what's my main module look like? It's really complex. I'm sure you're all impressed here. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, again, we're, we're trying to make sure that we illustrate the important things, what's going on here. And then we would need to publish this. So the result that we would expect to get from this is that after we've done an NPM install of Thingify, assuming I've published it, or if I, I mentioned there's ways to get around this, are you familiar with NPM link, anybody? OK, NPM link is how you install globally on your own local computer a module that you've been writing. It allows you to, uh, to, if I'm working on one module, I run npm link and it'll install it globally. And then in another module that I want to be a dependency of that local thing, I can say npm link thingifier. 
and it will effectively install in that other project a link through symlinks on the file system to, uh, to the dependency that I wanted to, to make changes to. This allows you to, to make changes in a dependency, test those changes in the dependency locally, and move on. There's some challenges with it because it's using symlinks. Um, and if you're familiar with the way um, with the way NPMs require or nodes require works, um, you may f be somewhat familiar with this or may be able to anticipate it. Symlink NPMs require works based on the real path of your file, and uh, NPM link sets up a symlink in your node modules. So what happens is if you do a uh, if you are in any way re relying on the module being inside the node modules folder, it won't actually work. You won't, you won't travel up the same path to, path to the root of your file system that you expect. So that's, a, that's kind of a tangent here, but you should be aware if you're using NPM link and you're relying on the file system, um, it may not do what you expect it to do. So, but it's a, still a useful tool. Anyway, once we've installed Thingifier, we would expect to see in our node modules folder, um, within node modules, there'll be a bin directory. And under that, we'll see a Thingifier um, executable script. This on a, on a, on a POSIX system, on OS, on OS 10 or, uh, or Linux, Thingifier is just going to be a JavaScript file that's run with Node. Um, on Windows, you'll see a Thingifier CMD so that you can run it within the, within the Windows command shell, and that will in turn run Node and run the, the Thingifier CLI that we looked at. So if we're looking at this, if we want, it's gonna, those things are going to refer to this file and run it, um, and we'll go from there. Okay. So, how many of you are familiar with what a hash bang is? Again, the, the same people who've done shell scripting know what a hash bang is. Okay, there's a reason for that. It's a Unix thing. Um, uh, a hash bang is a line at the beginning of, yeah, we'll go back to it because you can see it right here. See this line that starts with a hash and then an exclamation point? That's a hash bang, also known as a shebang. Um, and this hash bang says, hey, if you want to know how to run this file, you should look at, or you should run this file with the executable that you'll find here. Now, you'll note there's something funny going on with this one. And maybe, yes, I have it right here in the presentation. You'll note that we're using user env in the, in the node hash bang. This is kind of a trick. Um, Normally, a hash bang refers directly to an executable. What user bin env does on a, uh, on a POSIX system is it, it's used to set up a particular environment. But in this case, you're using it to set up an environment really quickly that uses your path to find the node executable. And it returns that node executable to the hash bang. So the hash bang says, oh, I'll just run this script using node wherever I found it. Windows ignores it. <laughs> Windows doesn't know what a hash bang is, but it's been set up to ignore it. I guess it treats it as a comment. And then there's another aspect of this. Some versions of Linux might give you trouble. Um, Debian had a node package before Node.js really caught on. And so when Node.js came along, um, Apt, they did the packaging and they said, ah, sorry, you can't have the name Node, we'll give you the name Node.js, and it got set up that way. As far as I'm aware, I've used, I've used Node on, on uh, Ubuntu-based systems, and I haven't had too much trouble with this, so I'm not too worried about it, um, but I'm bringing it up because you'll see, if you go searching on this subject, you'll see people calling this out as something to watch out for. Um, but, you know, it's there. It's something that exists, and then you may have to deal with it. You know what? Um, before we get into the a little more advanced part of this, let's do something absolutely crazy, and I will demonstrate my inability to write code um, while doing a presentation. 
starting with the inability to even identify an editor that I'm going to work with. <laughs> All right, let's open that up in another. Have I got anything here? All right, starting Adam in this directory. You know what, I need to create a package JSON. Did I, did I do anything with it? No, I didn't there. Yeah, I did not. Okay. So we'll make a directory. Thing, 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 thing. <laughs> Thing of fire. We'll npm init to give ourselves a uh, to give ourselves a package JSON. We'll call it thing of fire. We'll say version one. We're do the things. Are we cut off a little bit? There we go. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, again, running running npm init, setting up basic package JSON. I'm going to be evil and not test this. Um, well, that can be another subject. Not setting up the Git repository, not setting up keywords, not even going to give you my name. But this is MIT license, so if you want to steal it, too bad. You can use it as, at your at your leisure. <laughs> All right. So now I've got package JSON. I need index.js. I'm going to need a bin directory. And we're going to need that file there. OK. Now, let's get to building. Okay, so in index.js, what did we say we needed here? We said, see, I'm cheating here. I said I was going to type, but actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy-paste. Package JSON. I need bin that refers to thing of fire. Okay, index.js. I need to export a function that's going to call console log. You know, something super complicated here. And then my bin thingifier.js. We need our hash bang line. A comment to tell us what we're doing here. We're going to uh, just require the, the, the module that happens to be in the directory up from us here. Um, and then thing of fire here. So in theory, if I've written my code right, and I don't know that I have, if I've written my code right, if I do an NPM link, <laughs> yeah, you know. Sometimes you have to just usability test NPM, just make sure it works right. Um, so you can see here, NPM link has set up a, uh, has set up a link uh, for Thingifier in my, in my user's global node module. So if I type Thingifier, crossing my fingers here, you ran Thingifier. <laughs> so that's the very basics of building a, a Node.js command line tool. Now, um, what might you want to do with a command line tool? Can anyone think of command line tools that either are written in Node.js or that they might like to write in Node.js? Babel. Babel. Is Babel in Node.js? Yes, Babel.cli is. I think it probably is, but I don't really know. I haven't really looked into Babel. Um, Webpack is. Webpack is definitely a node CLI. Um, 
Any of you use Grunt or Gulp? Grunt and Gulp are, are task runners that are written as, as Node.js command line interfaces. Um, how about ESLint? Anybody use ESLint? Hands? I use ESLint. ESLint is a Node CLI. Um, there's a bunch of different things you might want to build as a Node CLI. There's a reason that, uh, that you might want to do this. Um, question? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. I, uh, I'm sorry, it was just not something I've published to GitHub. I will, and I will post these, I'll post a link to it, both in the Utah.js Node channel and in the Node.js Slack channel, on Slack. Um, so it'll be in both places. You can get at those things, and I'll work with Ethan to make sure his links are available there as well. Okay. Um, there's a reason you might want to do this. Uh, why do people use a task runner like Gulp or Grunt? It's a pre-process step for deploying a web Right. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can do with this. A lot of most of the CLI implementation and CLI node command lines that uh, that are really popular are involved in exactly those steps. I'm using them for some purpose to evaluate my source code in one way or another. ESLint is going through my source code and it's linting it. It's saying, do I obey these rules? Do I have a consistent way of writing my code? Um, am I watching out for things like uh, accidental semicolons <laughs> or lack of semicolons that, that make the code do something entirely different than I intend it to do? Um, or grunt or gulp, I'm doing a build process. Webpack is the, is the same thing, a build process and in Webpack's case, you set it up with loaders that, that, uh, that it's supposed to run your code through. In the case of Gulp, you set up uh, plugins that you stream the files through. And in the case of Grunt, you set up plugins that, I don't even know how to describe what Grunt is doing. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of reasons that you might want to run uh, a Node CLI. One of the things that you'll that you may be aware of. Here in package.json, we've got this script key. Now you can see test here. Let's change this up a little bit. This, you would never do this in, a real, in the real world. I'm demonstrating how this works though. The uh, NPM has a built-in task runner to it, kind of, with this, with this scripts key here. In your package JSON, if you save a script by the name of test, and we'll do another one by the name of example, wow, I really want that extra I in there. Um, it's kind of a thing with me. If I if I make a spelling mistake once, it's ingrained, and it, and I'm, it, it I will forever be switching my I's and E's and whatever else uh, might be going on here. Okay, so having done that, if I run npm test, npm test is going to run Thingifier for me, and you can see that it's doing that. Uh, you can see that it's doing that right here. Runs Thingifier, and you can see, hey, you ran Thingifier. Well, so there's this thing, there's a, there's a way of, uh, people have looked at this thing as, hey, I've already got a task runner built into npm. Why don't I go ahead and use that? And that's great. And then they start chaining these things together and they start finding. So what this does is it says, okay, they sa he said NPM test, or in this case we'll do uh, NPM run example. Same sort of thing here. I want to run a task. I've got a task. It's in my script, NPM scripts block. It's in my package.json 
scripts block, I want to run it. So I run npm run example, it goes and it looks up in that block example, and it says, oh, he's given me a nice shell command that I can run here, a nice command line interface that I can run here. What this does is it uses the, the, uses the operating system's default shell. So on Linux, that's Bash, probably. On, uh, on OS X, that's Bash, probably, unless you've done some things to change that. And on Windows, that's Command Com. Now, if you're familiar with Command Com and with Bash, you'll know that there are some things that are the same, and there are some things that are not. So I can do I can do that and it will probably work. It'll run thing of fire twice for me. Yay! I'm happy about that. And it'll probably work on Windows too. And if if I get to it and I can pull it off and I push this code up and I can pull it down on that computer, maybe we'll demonstrate it working on Windows as well. That was the idea of having that computer, but eh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, but things start to get a little bit interesting when what I want to do is export foo equals bar and no, wait, I need to help me out here, Ben. Do I want the ampersands or not? No. <laughs> That's right, thank you. So this is one example. Ben knows his shell scripting better than I do. Um, so that's a good reason. So now I'm setting the foo, uh, I'm, I'm setting the foo environment variable, and we'll get to how we can read those things within Thing of Fire in a bit, or within a CLI application in a bit. I'm setting that, and then I'm running my, and then I'm running my thing. Well, the way you set environment variables in Bash is different than the way you set environment variables in command com in, on Windows. And so one reason that you might look at this and say, hey, I want to I want to write a CLI is instead of writing to this sort of narrow API that happens to be the combination of things that you can do in both bash and command com, you can say, you know what? NPM scripts, by the way, there's a reason this another reason this is working and that is that uh, thing of fire is on my path. What uh, NPM scripts will do is it'll take, it'll take anything that has been installed in node module. Well, nothing's in node modules right now. I'll, uh, you know what I'm going to do? NPM install. We'll do gulp. Not that I'm actually going to use it, but I'm going to install it here for you. Um, Gulp is going to install, and because Gulp is a command line tool, you know, I should have done ESLint. ESLint would be something I might actually want to use, or tape, um, or tap, or any number of testing tools. Um, I never do, though. <laughs> you can. You can install Gulp globally, and Gulp does some interesting magic to say, I'm a globally running version of Gulp, and now I'm going to go and I'm going to look for your, in the, in the, in the project's current working directory, and I look and see if there is a pro the project has its own version of Gulp, and I'm going to use that one instead, and then I'm going to get the Gulp JS uh, the, the the Gulp file and run it. Um, and there's a there's a whole set of Node command line tools that are built in the same way. Grunt does the same thing, where you install it globally and you also install it in the project. And it, personally, I don't like to do that. I just like to install it on the project, and I put in my path, I put node modules dot bin at the front of my path. Now, who can tell me what that might do? Like if I echo path. Well, I guess it's not the first thing in there because I've got Python somehow ahead of that. But you can see in my path, I have node modules dot bin. Anybody know what that does? Which gulp? 
Well, when I run gulp from this particular directory, it's going to get gulp out of node modules bin. So it's going to get my local version of gulp. This is why gulp has you install it globally and then also locally, is the global install will go and look up your local one. And I found that, hey, if I just put it, I just do a local install of it, and I make sure that node modules bin is in my path, I don't need the global install of it. So I don't need to worry about version con conflicts or anything like that. The, the build tool is now a dependency of my project only. So that's a, it's a personal preference as to how I do that, but that's how I do that. So this is the other thing I wanted to point out. When I install a command line tool, something that has been like this, and we can kind of look at this. If we look in, if I find gulp here, we'll find gulps. Do, do, do. Is this the example of it? So gulp has that bin there. Package JSON. Bin gulp is in bin gulp JS. So it took this file and it installed it, or actually a link to it, here in here in node modules bin. The nice thing about that is, as we talked about in our presentation here, um, where? No, here, here. On Linux, here's Thingafire, and on Windows, Thingafire.cmd. Okay, and we'll close out that package JSON. Here's that. So what does this do for us? Well, it means that I can just reference Thingifier directly. Another thing to know is that that trick of putting your local folders node modules dot bin file at the beginning of your path is something that NPM does for you when you run an NPM script. This allows you if you wanted to, you could create build. You could create any number of command line tools and refer to them here in your scripts directory and be able to run those directly in your script like this. What that does is it gives you a quick entry point to get from running on your command line in whatever your shell happens to be into JavaScript, into the Node API. Um, and if you're like me and you're more comfortable coding in JavaScript than just about anything else, because you happen to like Node and you've spent a lot of time there and you're you know, in an echo chamber, um, <laughs> um, you've got this great cross-platform API that you're very familiar with that you can use to write your command line interface to do whatever it is you need it to do. Um, so this is one of the primary reasons why I like to write uh, command line applications in Node, is it's a useful way to put together build tools, um, uh, things that evaluate my source code, uh, et cetera. Um, you might come up with other ways to do this, but that's, uh, that's my primary reasoning for why I do that. Okay, a little more advanced. Back to our presentation here. Command line arguments. Um, who's familiar with process argv? Okay, a couple people here. What is process argv? It's right there up on the screen for you, so whoever wants to read that. <laughs> it's an array of space separated arguments passed to the process starting with the path to node and the, and the running script. So let's, uh, let's make that abundantly clear. And we'll run process argv here, or we'll console log process argv here. Now, here I'm going to run Thingifier. And it's not going to do that. Oh, wait, it did. I'm sorry, because we linked it. <laughs> I forgot. OK, so because we linked it, you can see I ran it with no command line arguments. And it gave me 
the path to the node executable it's running. Um, if you're running an electron, it'll give you the path to electron as opposed to the path to node here. Um, and then it gave me the path to the actual file that's running. Those are process argv 0 and 1. So if I do thingifier Sean, you can see Sean ends up as the next argument. I'm going to think of fire Sean, Ethan, Aaron. Hey, now there's three or four more, uh, three more arguments there. Okay, you can, uh, yeah, which is pretty embarrassing because it's my name. Um, <laughs> Um, I did that for your entertainment. <laughs> ben deals with my misspellings all the time. so <laughs> I don't have a spell checker built into Thingifier yet. Maybe I should. Hmm. <laughs> all right. So that's nice, but it starts to, it's, it, what happens if I, actually, these are, uh, what if I want these to be, Options. We'll correct the spelling here. Oh, well, it didn't parse those options for me. So one of the things that, uh, yeah, surprise, surprise. <laughs> so we could parse this ourselves. We could go through the array and we could say, okay, we're, who's got the who's got the little dashes and and which of those is going to be a. a which of those is going to be a flag that I want to attach some things to. But you know what? There's more than a few uh, packages out there that, that do this for us. Uh, Yargs, Minimist, NOP. People have written command line parsers for Node. Um, so I'm lazy. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to use one of them. Uh, this is one of the other things I love about building in Node is there's a module for just about everything. Usually not quite with the API that I want, so I'll rewrite it someday. But um, <laughs> but let's uh, let's npm install yargs, and this will take an hour or so, and uh, we'll be done with the presentation by the time it's done. Now, um, actually, it's pretty quick, and Okay, const yargs equals I wonder if that will work, if I've remembered how to do it. <laughs> Not quite. This happens to be the API to, to Yargs that I'm forgetting. Okay, so what Yargs will do is it will take your array of command line arguments and it will say, okay, if you've got two dashes in front of that, I'm going to make that a flag, and I'm going to create an object for you. So Sean becomes true, Ethan becomes true, Aaron becomes true, and the command you ran was thingifier. So yay, we're parsing command light arguments. The Yargs API is huge. It's an exercise for the, uh, for the, for the audience to learn about it. I'm not going to present that today. Um, so let's move on to our next slide. Is Yargs your, your preferred? Generally speaking, it is. I used to use Minimist and, and, and Opt, um, but Yargs has a couple of nice features that I like. It's a, more, it's a more recent one, and you'll find that a lot of people recommend using Yargs these days. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that Yargs has, uh, you can give it a command, you can give it a configuration, and it will read um, environment variables for you, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Yargs also does a really good job of figuring out when you meant the thing to be a, uh, 
a number versus a string. So if I if I do this again like this, and I say Sean is cool, Ethan is smart, and Aaron is too. Sean is cool, Ethan is smart, and Aaron is a two-year-old. Um, so there's some nice things that, that the YARGS API just does for you directly. Um, so that's parsing command line arguments. You can, um, I'll leave it to your imagination as to what you want to do that for. Uh, environment variables. Who can tell me what an environment variable is? Don't everybody raise your hand at once. And the same people, okay, here we go. <laughs> Okay. Right. These are environment. Environment variables are variables that are set in your current shell's running environment. So if I am, and correct me if I'm wrong on that too, Ben. But um, but if I. Uh, I think the important word is runtime. Though. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's in your current. So in this particular directory. In this, particular, in this particular terminal, I've set an environment variable. Uh, actually, that environment variable we set previously of foo is probably still set. If I do echo foo, is that going to? No. Thank you. Nope. Apparently, it's not set. Good. I would. <laughs> Good. I, uh, that didn't. It, it was set within an npm script. It stayed within the shell that it was that it was executed in to, ec to distinguish between the running sh the, the shell you're running in, and it made run a subshell where you set environment variables. Okay. So, but I do have. Is it set? Yeah, set. I have a huge number of environment variables here. Uh, bash. Current node. Yeah. Uh, path itself, home. There's a lot of different variables that have been set in my shell that are accessible within Node. So they're accessible via process env. All right, so back to our amazing Thingifier. We're going to run it. We ran Thingifier. Sean is cool. Ethan is smart. Aaron is two. We ran Thingifier. That's from our argv. But you can also see, hey, I've got a node version and a term program and a term and a shell and a tempter and a bunch of environment variables that are accessible via process env. Now, environment variables are used, one of their best uses is for being able to set configuration that your program is going to run with um, at any given time. Um, at OC Tanner, we use, a, uh, we, use a, uh, we use some guidelines for our apps called the 12-factor app, and they recommend uh, the 12-factor app recommends that in production, your code should run according to environment variables for configuration, period, end of story. Um, this allows you to inspect pretty quickly how your, uh, the environment that your code is running in and know what configuration it's running with. Um, so environment variables are a really great way, this is what they're for, a really great way to configure how a how some code should run. You can also use command line arguments to do that, and I'm kind of showing you how to do that. And for a CLI, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you can also do that using RC files, which is something we'll get to next um, after this. Okay, so process env. Hey, lots of packages help you with this too. Yargs will help you uh, transform prefixed environment variable keys into nested configuration objects. And let's take a look at how that might work. Um, we'll start by maybe setting a few environment variables. We'll call it thing. Eh, I'm doing it again. Eyes in the wrong place. 
thing uh, fire foo equals foo fire bar baz equals buzz nah one okay so I've set a couple of those there and then let's see if I can remember the yargs API well enough um, I'm going to cheat a little bit because we're using yargs already up here. I think what I want is env. And this might or might not work. Oh. At least I'm consistent. <coughs> okay. If I'm lucky, this works. And if I'm not, then you're going to take my word for it and we're going to move on. Because, you know, we've only got 45 more minutes of this and you can certainly stand to listen to me for that long. Okay. Hey, look at this. Bar, Baz, One, and Foo. Um, do you know how those got there? They're not on my command line. Console logged all the thing, all the environment variables that started the thing in buyer. Um, why did they get lower case? And why did you not have to do anything like a star to say everything after? Okay, so this is what Yargs is doing for me. So you can see I've got thing of fire foo right here and thing of fire bar baz right here. So I set those environment variables. Thing of fire bar baz one and thing of fire foo is foo. What Yargs has done is I've said, hey, go find every environment variable that starts with thing of fire. And actually it's it's gonna find you all the environment variables that start thing of fire underscore. And it's going to create an object. It's going to add to my configuration object that it's parsing what comes next. So in the case of foo, that became foo. And it lowercased it for me. Okay, it actually will camel case it for you. So if you, uh, if you foo underscore one, or no, let's not do that. Let's foo underscore fee. Yeah, because that makes a whole lot of sense, right? That's going to end up something like that, foofy. Okay? And you, can, you may have noticed that we did bar double underscore baz, right? That was one of them that we parsed here. And that became an object, a bar, an object that had baz with its value, one. So the double underscore in the, in the way Yargs parses your environment variables, it treats the double underscore as a, uh, as a nested object. Now I'm going to show you another thing here. Let's put bar.baz equals 2. Oops, that's not quite what I want. Bar baz, I think I can do it this way. Yes. So note, even though thing of fire bar baz down here is set to one, because I put, put bar baz on the command line with a dot, it parsed that and said, oh, that should be a nested object, and two, and it intelligently merges those things. Command line arguments take precedence over environment variables. <sighs> So I said I wasn't going to go too deep into the Yargs API. I actually haven't. It's that deep. <laughs>
There's a lot that you can do with the Yargs API. It's really cool, really powerful. But you can also see it gives you some nice things right out of the box. You don't have to go deep into it to get some tools that are very useful. Okay, configuration files. Grunt, Gulp, Webpack. You've used these before. You've used these configuration files. Um, where do these configuration files live? At the root of your project, right? If you're like me, the root of your project ends up having 20 configuration files in it. You go a little bit nuts with that because you, I thought I was writing code. No, I'm not actually writing code. I'm writing configuration. And for Webpack, that's a JavaScript file that does who knows what. For, for Gulp, that's another JavaScript file that does something else. And for Grunt, it's a JavaScript file that does something else again. Um, if it's ESLint, well, that's a JSON file that has a very specific format. If it's StyleLint, it's a JSON file that has the same format as ESLint, except for completely different rules. Um, and you start to look at this thing and go, uh, wait, which of these is doing what in my project? Eh, okay. They're still useful, and I don't have an expl and I don't have an answer for you, but they're living at the root of. Oh, look! I told you that that's where they were living. I asked a question. I give you the answer. How nice of me! Um, <laughs> sorry. RC files. Who can tell me about RC files? What What is an RC? If I have an ESLint RC file, what is it? Where does it go? The root of the project I'm looking at? Is that the only place an ESLint RC file goes? No, Ethan's shaking his head. Where else does it go? If you put them in any subfolder, and then the rules in that will apply only down that part of the tree. Okay. So as ESLint is running on a particular file, it has to look up the directory path from the file it's looking at and find every ESLint RC file that is up. The, that is up the path from it, up to, perhaps up to the project root. I don't remember if that's the case, but it may be up to the project root, and merge those configurations together. Babel RC, similar, but I think it only lives in your project. Um, NPM RC, who knows about NPM RC? Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> NPM ignore, I think, is where you say I don't want to publish stuff to, to I don't want to publish stuff uh, from these from these folders. Um, it defaults off of git ignore, and then it, it adds some things with npm ignore. So and, the thing you can't put in npm rc is say you want to use a different registry link for a given project, and not go to the public one, but maybe go to a private one. If you drop an npm rc into the root of the project, all your npm commands will go against that one. You can drop one in your home directory as well, and that will overwrite everything unless the project happens to also overwrite. Okay, so this is exactly what I wanted to illustrate. NPM RC allows you to provide configuration to the NPM command line. It pays attention to the NPM RC file that is in your current directory, and the NPM RC file that is in your user directory, and the NPM RC file that is in the system directory, like uh, uh, etc. NPM RC. Actually, that may be a lie with NPM RC, but many RC files, they do that. Um, so the, the tool that I used, the, that I frequently have used, oh, also, often you see, like with Babel, you may see this configuration in your package JSON under, say, a Babel key. Um, it's another place you may want to pull configuration from. Lots of places that a command line tool might pull configuration from, and it's kind of useful to be able to pull all of those things in. So, yeah. There's lots of different options for doing that. I've been writing one called configurate. I'm not going to, uh, it's in here because I was talking, thinking about showing it off, but um, let's look at RC. RC is an old classic for doing this. Um, it's been around for years, um, and what it will do is it'll pull file, it'll, it'll 
it uses minimist for command line arguments and then environment variables similar to what we demonstrated with YARGs. Uh, doesn't parse them as cleanly in my opinion, so I use YARGs anyway for CLI and for other things. Um, and then it will look in your for a local RC file, a home RC file, a home config file, a home config app. You know, so it looks in a bunch of different places, and all that stuff gets merged together in a, in a priority order. So command line arguments are most important, and the defaults object that you pass into RC is the least important there. So do I want to demonstrate anything with that? Eh. I think I'm done. Anybody have any questions? Or anything you would like to see? All right. I'm going to shut this down. We've got half an hour and we can talk. Thanks for coming today. <laughs>